There have been some amazing, talented individuals so far. And I encourage you to uh, check them out on the live stream. Now, I'm going to be talking about landscape photography and as well as a little bit of time-lapse photography. Um, I am a landscape and travel photographer based in the Pacific Northwest. I've been shooting with Nikon cameras ever since I first got into the craft at the age of 14, and I primarily use the Nikon D750 as my main tool for capturing photos and videos. I also am studying business marketing at Oregon State University, and I'm hoping to apply the skills I learned there to uh, travel, photography, and videography. Now, for the longest time, I really wanted to find what my passion was. Um, I wanted something that would help motivate me and help guide me throughout the, my life. And it was here in the Colorado Rockies. Whoops, what happened there? Uh, looks like we got some technical difficulties. But it was in the uh, Colorado Rockies um, that I uh, found that passion. Uh, my dad lent me um, his Nikon D5100 for a two-week backpacking trip. And uh, that is where my journey with photography started. Now, at the time being, I didn't really know what to do with my camera. I was just a kid fooling around with an expensive piece of equipment. Um, but it was after the trip that I picked up the camera again, and I uh, tried to learn as much as I could about the craft. I would come home every day after school and would spend countless hours researching uh, different YouTube tutorials, browsing different articles on how to take better photographs. Um, and eventually, this became more than just a pastime for me. Uh, it, began, uh, it was a way for me to look at the world in a different way. Everything I saw became an opportunity for a photograph. Now, how many landscape photographers are out here in the audience here today? All right, a couple of you, awesome. Well, in my opinion, landscape photography can be one of the most rewarding mediums out there. Uh, it does have its fair share of challenges, though. Legendary photographer, pioneer Ansel Adams said it best. Landscape photography is the supreme test of the photographer and often the supreme disappointment. Sleep deprivation, hiking with way too much gear, and the disappointment of coming home from shooting, shooting uh, empty-handed are often struggles I have to overcome. But these challenges are kind of why I like landscape photography. Um, it's really the pros vastly outweigh the cons, in my opinion, and it's the experiences that stick with me the most. It's really those brisk early mornings, those dark nights under the stars or quiet hikes into the mountains that really stick with it the most. And I think a little discomfort goes a long way for the photographs and memories that will last a lifetime. Now we think about landscape photography, what comes to mind? Generally, images comprised of immense views and grandeur uh, are often the case when we think about landscape photography. And that is true, like this image here taken in Yosemite National Park. Um, but it can also be focusing on the much more intimate details in our landscape, such as this cluster of false hellebore in Mount Rainier National Park. So a little backstory behind this photo. A friend and I were up all night photographing stars in the park. And the next morning, we were walking down the trail, and we saw this cluster of plants really just pop out at us. So we got busy, got to work photographing the different angles and patterns that these plants made. And I was so focused on what I was doing, I didn't realize 45 minutes had gone by just photographing a few plants. <laughs> it was really uh, refreshing to be able to photograph something uh, different than just the much more obvious wider landscape shots. And now I'm uh, constantly on the lookout for uh, photos of intimate landscape perspectives. Now, this image here, I wanted to talk about a particular um, uh, issue that I know a lot of landscape photographers struggle with, and that is making good images in not so good conditions. Now, this image here was taken in Cannon Beach, Oregon. Uh, the light was super harsh, uh, very flat, and I tend to try to shoot my photos on days um, where the light is a little bit. Um, uh, you know, the light is around sunset or sunrise when there's much more depth to the photos. Um, and this was not really ideal. But I was in Cannon Beach for a limited amount of time, and I decided, hey, why not? Let me go out and try to shoot some photos on the beach, see what catched my eye. 
And what I noticed was there's this very unique haze on the horizon from uh, the sea spray of crashing waves on the sea stacks. And I got extremely low for this perspective. I dropped to my stomach um, and began photographing uh, this seagull as he made his way uh, into the frame here. And in this sense, I really think uh, landscape photography is really just uh, the best way um, to find new perspectives and opens your minds to, to new views like this. Now, this is the phenomenon known as the Yosemite Firefall. I'm sure some of you have seen it. It's in Yosemite National Park. Um, and during a two-week window in February, the sun is in a perfect position to light up the waterfall, to almost make it appear as it's on fire. Now, there's a few uh, things that really have to work well for this. And uh, the first is there has to be clear skies, there has to be high water flow in the falls, and you have to be looking at it from the correct perspective. Uh, really fantastic view. Now, many photographers come here during this time of year, and rather than uh, battle the crowds, I decided to take a lesser known trail, went up to grab a fresh perspective above the valley, valley and watched as the sun began to set, the waterfall began its multicolored process a light yellow to a dark orange to finally a deep red as the sun went down. Really incredible sight. Now this image here is of the super blue blood moon. It's kind of a mouthful. But what the super blue blood moon is, is uh, it's a lunar eclipse that coincides with a super moon, which is when the moon is slightly bigger and brighter, and a blue moon, which is a second full moon in one month. Now, originally, I had plans to shoot this image on Mount Hood, and I was going to be lining up a skier silhouetted in front of the moon. And this would be done using a super telephoto lens, the Nikkor 200 to 400 millimeter f4 with a 1.4 times teleconverter. Now, all was good to go up until the day before the shoot. And of course, what happens? Heavy clouds, snow, rain forecasted for the mountain, and the visibility was down to zero and the shoot got canceled. But as bummed as I was, I wasn't going to miss out on an opportunity of photographing this spectacular phenomenon. So I packed up my stuff and drove five hours down to the southern Oregon coast where the visibility was predicted to be a little bit clearer. Now, this image here is comprised of uh, three different images. So this, is, this perspective here is in Samuel H. Boardman State Park and overlooking Arch Rock. And for obvious reasons, it's called Arch Rock. And um, th like I said, three images here. The first one was taken using the super telephoto lens. And um, I used that to get a very crisp, even uh, picture of the blood moon. And then I switched over to the Nikkor 20, uh, 14 to 24 millimeter 2.8 to capture two different uh, exposures for the foreground. The first image with the uh, wide angle was a 20 second exposure to make sure that the stars were nice and crisp. And the second image with that lens was a 300 second exposure um, using my camera's bulb mode uh, to really capture a nice uh, even uh, photo of the, the details in the foreground without there being any noise. Now this image here uh, is also another example of shooting perspectives in not so good conditions. I arrived and I really wanted to shoot sunset on this particular evening, but I arrived and the sun was nowhere to be seen. It was dark and cloudy um, and not really great. The wind was blowing, it was whipping sand and rain and uh, water right into my camera lens and face, and I really was debating on packing up and going home. But I remembered it's moments like this that really push us as artists and help us grow. Um, I think if there was great light and awesome compositions handed to us on silver platters every time we went out to shoot, this type of photography would lose its allure. I think it's the uncertainty of landscape photography that really helps make the craft so special. Every day in the field is different. There's different light, uh, different weather patterns, and also a different perspective on the area you are shooting. Now, sometimes I'll go to a place with a certain image in mind that I want to get, and others I will uh, go to a place with no expectations and just see where my creativity takes me. Now, I find the latter to be a very good exercise when uh, wanting to shoot in new areas because it really opens up the mind, and you'll be surprised 
at just how creative you can be with coming up with new compositions. This is uh, one of my favorite images that I shot recently. Um, it is of, uh, this is a, it looks like it's a frozen waterfall, but the icicles hanging around are frozen, in fact. But this is using a long exposure to capture one of the snowiest days I have ever experienced. Um, this is a waterfall in Oregon. And really just paying attention to the composition, having this nice flow of water in the foreground really helps, um, uh, really goes well with also the nice flow coming down from the falls. One of my favorite images I have created recently. Now, speaking of favorite images, this image here was taken in uh, Yosemite National Park, and it was one of my favorites as I was getting into photography. Now, this image was shot from several thousand feet away, and I had to play around with a different focal length in order to capture uh, the same feeling and mood that I saw with my own eyes. Now, zooming in too much, certain parts of the composition I wanted in were left out. And a wider perspective made the photograph too busy, but there was somewhere in between that this photo really came to life for me. Now, abstract photographs are really part of uh, what makes landscape special. Rather than just uh, looking past the more obvious, wider view and uh, really you know, using your camera to capture some very unique images, this technique was using uh, intentional camera movement. So what I did is I held the camera very still and using a longer exposure, I believe I was shooting at uh, 1 20th, 1 25th of a second, I would pivot my camera quickly up and down um, to create these uh, streaky motion blur photographs in the stands of poplar trees. What I really like about this is the different composition that you can come up um, with when uh, shooting uh, uh, these trees. Now, this is Denali National Park. And I want to talk about these next few images I will be sharing are from a trip to Denali and are some of my all-time favorite photographs I've ever um, taken. Now, this trip was just after my freshman year of college, and I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Really, uh, my friend and I piled into my car, and we drove, yeah, we drove 52, hour, uh, 52 hours on the open road in the span of a week from Sacramento, California, all the way up to the Kenai Peninsula in Alaska. Um, and over the span of five weeks, we toured all over British Columbia and Alaska, putting 10,000 more miles on my car's odometer. Needless to say, it ended up in the shop after the trip for a few days, but it was worth it. Um, these images are just some of my favorites and some of the most ex favorite experiences I've ever had. Now, this image here was taken in a place called Harding Icefield. Now, what Harding Icefield is, it is um, this massive area of ice that is the birthplace for over 30 glaciers. I want you to picture a glacier. Imagine how big one individual glacier is, and now imagine an area of ice that sp is the spawn for over 30 of those. This place is just huge. And because of that, I found it was a little bit tricky um, to capture um, just the scale of how big this landscape was. And I incorporated the human element to bring some of that scale back. Now, this is my buddy climbing up on a field of gravel and rock. And um, I really just enjoy how that brings some of the scale back into, photo into the photograph. Now, this is uh, a photo of Lake Clark National Park. I knew I wanted to photograph bears. Um, so what I did is I asked a local air service if I could fly out to Lake Clark National Park and preserve where uh, there are a high number of bears at this time of year. I also learned that air travel is extremely important to many Alaskans. Uh, over 70% of the state can only be accessed through the air, and about one out of every 100 Alaskan citizens actually has their pilot's license, which is very impressive. And so I thought it was cool to be able to capture a photo that's um, so special and uh, important to the day-to-day -day life and culture of the people living there. Now, this was a photo I got of a bear on that same trip. Uh, there are about a half dozen bears in the area, and as soon as I stepped off the plane, not more than five minutes had gone by since this large female brown bear here came lumbering down the shoreline um, towards me. I used a Nikon D750, uh, D750 and uh, 70 to 200 millimeter F2.8 to capture these photos. This is probably my favorite of the bunch. Now, Alaska is notorious for its size and grandeur, but I decided to focus on one day on photographing um, 
uh, its smaller gems, which were coho salmon. Now, thousands of salmon make the long, strenuous journey from the sea to breed in upper reaches of the rivers in Alaska. And it was extraordinary to watch these fish jump incredible heights to overcome their obstacles. Now, for this photo, I set my camera up on a tripod. And before even taking an image, I spent a few minutes focusing on the river to see where these fish were jumping the most frequently. Once I found that spot, I used a telephoto lens and honed in on this composition here and patiently waited for a fish to jump into frame. Now, this was a very tedious process. Um, in most of my images, the fish was either out of focus, out of frame, or sharp, but not in a place that was compositionally pleasing for me. Uh, so <laughs> about 45 minutes and 1,000 images later, I finally grabbed one or two frames that I was happy with. So I was packing up my stuff, and it was dark at this time. Uh, getting darker, the sun was getting lower in the sky, an overcast layer was forming in the sky. And I'm heading on the trail, and I hear the crunch of big, heavy footsteps in the underbrush in front of me. And I think, oh no, it's a bear. I instinctively reach for my uh, canister of bear spray, thinking that a bear might be heading up the river for a late afternoon snack. And I did not want to be that snack. Uh, so. I relaxed as I saw these two emerge from the trail bend, but only a little bit because a mother moose is still nothing to be messed with around her young. She was at least seven feet tall, and she kept her eyes locked on me the entire time I was backtracking up the trail. And I didn't want her to feel threatened in any way, so I kind of backtracked up the trail and pulled my camera out and shot these images of these two as they were making their way towards the river. Now I wanted to move into aerial photography. Um, I got the chance to take a scenic flight over Denali National Park, and a friend of mine once told me, you haven't really seen Alaska's landscapes until you view them from the air, and they were absolutely right. Uh, getting this aerial perspective opened up a very fresh perspective of the landscapes below, and uh, also another set of challenges to go along with it. Now, this photo here was taken as we were passing over these mountain peaks, and I looked out the window, I noticed this tiny red speck underneath me, and I realized, that's a plane, and it turned out to be a plane of a uh, competitor to the air service I was flying with. And the scale the plane brings to this photograph was just amazing. Um, I think without the plane, it wouldn't be the same photograph. And it actually wasn't until I saw the plane with my own eyes that I realized how small I was compared to these massive peaks around me. And that feeling of smallness followed me around the entire trip through Alaska. Very humbling to be in these large scale environments. Now, I love this image. This was taken on uh, the way back from uh, the Denali towards Talkeetna, which is where the air service is located. And um, the transitions in this image are very great, not only from light to dark, but this was taken in autumn. So we have the transition from summer in the foreground to winter in the background. And um, really enjoy the different uh, uh, elements that those two uh, uh, seasons have. And it really shows the different elevations uh, that, this, that are in this photograph. Now, these last two images here were taken on a scenic um, flight, that same scenic flight through Alaska, and it shows Denali National Park. These two compositions were just shot within minutes and miles from each other. But you notice Denali has not changed its position at all, and that is because the, p the peak is absolutely huge. It's so large that it creates its own weather systems. And on average, only one out of three park visitors gets to see the top of Denali, Due to, due to how often it's covered in clouds. So I'd say we got pretty lucky on this flight. Now, this experience flying over these amazing planes was um, really just an incredible experience, still burned into the back of my mind today. And if you do ever get up to Alaska, I highly encourage contacting some of the local air services up there. There's plenty of them. And get up in the air, bring your camera, and uh, just try to focus on having fun up there. So now I wanted to talk about time-lapse photography. Now I got into time-lapse photography shortly after uh, uh, I discovered and picked up a camera. And for those that don't know, time-lapse is basically you're shooting a consecutive amount of images at a set interval. Later, you uh, use these images and compile them together into a video, which captures objects and events that are normally seen in the span of minutes, hours, and days, and it transforms them into a video that shows time going by in just mere seconds. Um, really incredible form of photography. And what I like most about it is it forces you to be patient. 
setting up your time lapse, you can just let it run. You have to just let it run. You can't touch your camera or anything. And with travel and landscape photography, often we're, we're so focused on chasing the light that we don't even realize, you know, we don't get a chance to soak in the beautiful things we see around us. Landscape photography can bring us to the most beautiful places in the entire world. And I think it's important to take some time to really appreciate what's around you. Um, so I wanted to talk about some techniques for getting started with uh, time lapse. Now, the first thing you should try to do is find an interval. For faster moving scenes, an interval between one and three seconds is preferred. And for longer moving scenes, such as the stars uh, moving over the sky or busy boat traffic in the San Francisco Bay, uh, a shutter speed between 10 and 30 seconds is preferred. Now, what's really cool about most semi-pro Nikon cameras and professional Nikon cameras that sets them apart is the built-in interval timer shooting, um, which allows you to shoot a time lapse uh, in camera. So if you scroll all the way to the bottom of your shooting menu, you will find interval time shooting right above time lapse photography function. Now there's slightly two different uh, uh, functions. The time lapse photography function is used to compile and shoot a time lapse video right in camera, which is great for people who are just starting out in time lapse because you don't have to worry about uh, putting the, t the video together in post production. Now the interval time sh timer shooting is what I use the most often because it shoots that consecutive amount of images at a set interval and gives you much more control over shooting um, uh, your, your final time lapse video. Now I believe we have time for uh, this film I put out. This will be the last um, portion of my talk. Uh, so Denali is uh, shot in the span of just three days in Denali National Park. It actually received a staff pick on Vimeo, which I was not expecting at all. But um, I used this time lapse photography technique to put out this film. Um, and without any further ado, please enjoy Denali.
All right, thank you so much. Uh, that was shot all on the Nikon D750 and D800. Um, I hope that video really encourages you to get out and uh, try experimenting with time lapse yourself. And I think that's all the time I have, so thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of CES. Now that is how you define awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, Taylor Gray.